you could turn your cell phones off, that would, uh, that would be appreciated. Turn you off. Oh. Is it, is it mine? <laughs> <laughs>
Barco was able to provide the ground utilities in a reference quality, so without these stochastic elements, but at least a operationally ready-to-use system. And the same was true for the airborne side with regard to the flight management systems for Barco, ground-based, as I said, for Boeing, the, um, the FMS technology, um, along with BADA 3 and BADA 4. And what we had in Dresden was a Airbus a simulation environment for the A320, which is going to be brought to you in more detail in the next slides. The idea is, first of all, what type of data transfer strategies could be used to transfer between air and ground these additional information packages. Second, what are the reasons for these uncertain overflight time? So we studied a lot of parameters which could bring in uncertainty into the system. And second, when this is true, what would we consider as a synchronized status between air and ground? It means how can we guarantee that ground and air hold the same information with the same quality? This is in then in the context along these high levels of automation strategy in a context of the autonomous arrival management. It means that the controller today acting on the arrival management is more and more taken away from the system and the system generates automatically the advisories sent back to the aircraft. So very automatically a driven process between the arrival manager and the extended FMS capabilities. Of course we assumed, because this was one of the big issues, we assumed traffic and entities inside the traffic situation, which is a standard situation I guess, that do not allow to cope with all these functions, so that are not ready to handle RTAs if you like, so required time of arrival requests from the arrival manager including stochastic components, so these simply refrain from complying with these and the arrival manager has to check and to see, oh, this aircraft is not able to cope with this type of information, so I have to deal it differently. And what we also tried to have in mind is that the time and geographic horizon in within which the arrival manager and the aircraft is planning its or their routes should be extended so to allow the system to have more flexibility and we created, which is also by now meanwhile, the so-called extended terminal maneuvering area which comes up to a range of roughly 300 to 400 nautical miles around Frankfurt allowing to interact quite early onto these trajectories well before flying into, let's say, the transitions towards the initial portraits. These are the three partners once again I already have talked a lot about Barco, so somehow that might be quite clear to you so far. Advanced trajectory management algorithms means this AMEN in its state of the art, as currently deployed in some Asian areas, I guess, has to be extended and uh, was adopted to the requirements of these four dimensional stochastic elements holding data transfers. This might impact the way of how an arrival manager uh, modifies trajectories within the ETMA, which mainly is holding its RTA declaration and it is past stretching strategy. So these should be reviewed in the light of these disturbances from outside. With Boeing, we had a clear focus not only on the provision of a Boeing FMS technology, but also on a very intensive interest in designing and improving their understanding in the so-called formal languages for data transfer and uh, we worked all together on the extension and the adaptation of the so-called aircraft intent definition language IEDL which was used in that project. This is if you like a super version of an XML data format allowing to exchange specifically tuned data packages in the light of the concept of Utopia or CISA. What we did, beside the provision of the Airbus flight management system capabilities, which we could bring in through this simulation environment, we studied the uncertainty sources and worked a lot with the meteorological guys. So coming from the hydrological and atmospheric research, we invested quite a lot into the analysis of meteor and US weather data in order to derive typical weather patterns which might create disturbances onto the traffic system. This is a time frame in brief. We are actually on the right side of this slide, of course, that's the nature of this meeting today. And so I will guide you now through the big, let's say, findings between work package, mainly two and five, since the concept, again, can be read very detailedly in, in the deliverables and might be a bit taken in, in the background for now. Once again, a few words nonetheless on that. We did a lot 
of review work and what is typically the starting point for each research work and to come directly on what we could identify is what we significantly need is a, an extended perspective timely and geographically so we created our concept around this extended terminal maneuvering area. It means we extended the capabilities again for the AMEN to act onto the trajectories. We designed data environment capabilities for stochastic models. We're going to see later on what is meant with that and we at the very end tried to um, encompass something like an umbrella to say whenever this concept is being installed and the simulations has been performed, what is the way of judging the quality of the outcome? After all, if all these technical elements have been installed in the system and we deal with these uncertain functions, can we learn something for the ATM system? So is the ATM system behaving better than today, yes or not? And so we created typically some performance indicators on which we judge the hoped improvement by adding information to the airborne side and by allowing the ground side to handle with these extra data. So that's more or less what the concept definition is. So at the very end, it's about a data scenario, a geographic scenario, and a way of judging the outcome of the simulations. These data synchronization work package two specifically uh, had also a lot of review work to do. And finally, we looked specifically and see what is mentioned here on the lower part of the slide, the 4D DRAD service document, which is a document from 2008 from the CSAR work, where a lot of ideas already showed up on how to deal with 4D trajectory data and considering uncertain data to some extent. And we used that as a reference line and um, started from there to adopt what I already mentioned, the exchange data format, IEDL, to our needs. This led to a formal language specification which has been implemented, again, to make it easy to understand, something like a super XML class which has been installed and implemented in the simulation environment. Stochastic modeling then looked at the various sources of disturbances for the traffic environment. All are more or less known to us. It's only the question of their magnitudes and their effects on the overall systems. And again, to make it brief on that point, we started with a bunch of roughly 40 to 50 parameters, which tackled a lot of aerodynamic parameters which are being collected in the flight data monitoring system of today's aircraft. We looked into so aerodynamic and flight mechanical behaviors, effects on disturbances coming from weather environment specifically, from heavy traffic situation in which you have interactions between clearances and say this leads to uncertain clearance qualities. And out of this big bunch of parameters we focused for the next analysis to come on the wind uncertainty, which then was very detailedly analyzed with regard to the quality of predicting wind in terms of intensity and of course reaction with regard to its look ahead time. And we could see that the different forecast models coming from the atmosphere research shows sometimes very intensive variations between one forecast and the next one. And so the problem was to say, when I plan a route through a given weather situation, um, I expect to have a certain wind information or wind situation 20 minutes ahead from now at this point X, Y in, in space. And for the next prediction coming up after 10 minutes or 15 minutes later, this information changed rapidly because we had fast moving wind patterns, if you like. This brings the whole problem in the process then um, in such a way that the prediction heavily changes for each iteration you go through this prediction. And so what we did is we invested a lot of, 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 of research on how we could, let's say, assume the reality in between the different predictions, since in effect we could analyze the real data at the very end, which also came from the known um, databases like Meteosat and NOAA, and we could see that the variation after all wasn't that much as predicted before. So we had to install something like low pass filtering strategies and saying it might be correct that this wind prediction is within limits to be expected from now on, but we assume that if the next prediction um, differs heavily from the previous one, we have to, let's say, um, low pass this data in order to catch better reality. And we could perfectly show that with this filtering strategy, um, indeed, the system works more robust and doesn't um, invoke more 
errors between the predicted value and the really measured value. So that, that is something which comes from the atmospheric area, which was very interesting for us to, to see how this impacts the capability of dealing with this uncertain, let's say, disturbance effect on the flight progress. Proof of concept, um, we implemented a lot, and this is what we're going to show you after the front presentation with slides in a video and in a simulation, how we performed the proof of concept and what type of case studies we did. The methodology. We start, of course, is, is a common understanding, a glossa, if you like, of what we understand by these main three areas which are dealt with within Utopia. The uncertainty, I guess, we can make it very brief. In a high perspective, we can say typically we have natural physical behavior in this uncertainty, so we have by linear and a steady functions which should be assumed for any type of, of uncertainty. So even though a thunderstorm area crosses along the ETMA, it will always be a continuous process and not an abrupt process since it's a physical behavior. So we can assume that we have density function representing the probability that a given data is correct or not. So it comes, if quite simplistically, to a first assumption. Each parameter should be represented by a Gaussian distribution. Maybe Gaussian is not the best one, but we could start with that. And after all, we could ask ourselves, is it really useful for each parameter to assume sub this type of PDF of probability density function? After all, what today is going on is what we assume is RNF and RNP. We say Whatever the different contributors are, after all, we assume a total system L, which is represented in the required navigation performance concept, shaping the bubbles around the air route and saying this is the expectancy area in which the aircraft will operate. And when it comes to actual navigation performance analysis, we can all see that the actual navigation performance values are much better than the RNP values, which is nice since, let's say, the quality or the performance of the aircraft is above what is being required from the procedure design. And what we here try is to break down this total system error perspective into the main parts. And the part on which we invested the most of work was the wind effect. And the weather effect as well in terms of convective weather areas, which is being presented later on. Synchronization, I guess this is um, the automated exchange of directory information between any participant and guaranteeing that the information is correct in terms of content and in terms of time, so there's no significant delay of this information situation at the different parties. Disruption finally was then concluded as uh, an interference occurring during directory synchronization, which finally invokes a partial or full loss of this synchronization status. In simple words, the arrival manager doesn't know exactly what is actually stored in the FMS on the airborne side, which should not be the case, but if this is true, the airmen should then work with best guesses and no longer with this extended data information which is assumed to be ready for within this concept of operation. This is uh, this bunch of different parameters we invested and what might be quite clear for you is that we tried then to allocate these different sources of uncertainty to the well-known INP values. So you have the cross-track, long-track and vertical track tolerance impact values if you like so the departure time error would clearly impact the long track error when it comes to the RNP understanding. So this is what we actually consider when working with RNP philosophies. And these factors here, they impact these different components of the RNP world. Obviously, what is very important for the timekeeping strategy, which is one of the big assets of the future synchronized traffic system, which is being anticipated in Utopia, is the capability of being well below the long track tolerance values preset by the system. And when it comes to, at least my understanding, when it comes to two days analysis of INP qualities, it mainly talks about cross track and vertical track tolerances. So how precise can the aircraft fly along a trajectory? And the long track tolerance is something which is not well dealt with so far in these models. Even so, in the RNP IKEA document, you cannot find a clear understanding on, on how you should reference the ATT, where it starts and from where the delay is being counted. So what we did finally is we referred to what all is known in the room is, we referred to the RTA, and the RTA is a required time of arrival at the initial approach fix, first of all, then being transformed by a static data routine to the time over the final approach fix. 
it must be known that the arrival manager in our simulation run was not able to handle stochastic data within this last part between EIF and FIF. So this is state of the art technology, but before the IIF, so when it comes to the transitions, and down to the EIF, <coughs> there the stochastic components came into play. Um, so when we assume that this trajectory now is generated, holding some stochastic uncertainty for each of the estimated time over any waypoint, you could ask yourself, again along this ATT strategy and the question, where should we synchronize the data? And uh, it could be here in, in a very early point in time where we only have flight intents and the only issues we have at this point is the scheduled time of arrival, if you like, and an estimated time of arrival. This is the estimation, this is the scheduling, which is known to the system, and at this time we could already ask, is the synchronization useful? Then, of course, we could um, invoke the, the um, detailed um, let's say a 4D trajectory generation and say we have a initial state within the flight progress and could say at this initial state we could um, try to synchronize with this initial state of surveillance so the first radar contact with an aircraft perhaps 100 nautical miles away from the airport or even 500 nautical miles away when it comes to this ETMA concept this could be one and of course we could go ahead of, of simply let's say using the state information and including the intent information which is also a let's say more or less classical view on how to improve the prediction quality for ATM functions and so we could use the intent information generated by the system here in the airborne system so in the FMS or we could use this intent information um, from the um, let's say generic FMS um, performance model implemented in the for example, arrival management capability provided by Barco. Of course, this is less accurate, which is to be expected, and so it might be useful finally to, to have a correlation right here. Or at the very end, the whole prediction is ready, and we would say with everything calculated quite late in the process, we would synchronize here. So this was also a lot of discussions and analysis where to go for. And of course, this doesn't make sense except for very special cases. Um, we come on to that later on. Um, it might be considered or remembered for you or recalled that um, we might have this special situation that very short haul flights depart within the ETMA yeah, and are scheduled for a arrival time into Frankfurt, not yet airborne, not having a radar contact at this time, even though the um, scheduled time of arrival is only 45 minutes ahead this could be a flight from Dresden to Frankfurt. So you're still on ground at Dresden, not yet airborne, and the system um, could not expect to have this data until the aircraft is airborne, so only on a, let's say, look ahead time of 30 minutes or so, one established an annual segment. So uh, for these special cases might be useful to have a synchronization already before um, the aircraft actually uh, departs. But for all other cases, it is clearly uh, useful to go for a later position and what we did is we, we uh, concentrated in this time horizon so right here even either this point that point or the last point so to cope best with the geographic and so time dimension with the ETMA it means so that we have a prediction time of 300 nautical miles coming to 45 minutes to 60 minutes ahead. Finally, for the strategy on how to judge and to deal with these outcomes of the simulations, on a very early stage we asked ourselves how could we deal with the effects we could measure or vice versa, what should we measure in order to get out the right messages. And so we had an, a principles view on how do we deal with uncertainty and uh, system performance. Having in mind what I told you about the synchronization status, we have a very pragmatic strategy in the back in saying Whenever it comes to uncertain data, it means that the variances for the expected overflight times increase. Um, there is a tendency that we will invoke more up and down links between aircraft and ground since these information should be renewed quite often, whereas when the uh, data is rather deterministic, there is no need to update data which is static. On the other hand, of course, and for those cases where um, more traffic comes into play, of course more data has to be transferred. Uh, strategically even aspects like conflict detection and resolution would 
increase the requirement of the amount of required data exchanges, which is all clear. So we had this idea in saying the system has a limited performance. Whatever computer you're using, he is only capable of, of, of handling a certain number of exchanges between air and ground. So for those cases where even uh, either um, driven by high complex traffic, so a lot of climbing and descending profiles, a lot of traffic overall either, or we would have quite uncertain data with high variances, we would at some point reach the system performance cap and beyond that the system is no longer ready and capable of transferring the required data amount. For those cases the synchronization more or less is getting lost and disruption occurs. To say it um, right at this point because time is limited, for these use cases we created, we never reached this disruption status. Also, we are quite sure that we could invoke it, but with the requirement set, which hope to be somehow realistic when it comes to radar, um, data backup generation, so how should the baseline scenario look like for Frankfurt for a given day? How is the uh, situation and very bad weather conditions where we have typical, let's say, thunderstorm conditions around Frankfurt Combined all this for the reference data we had, we couldn't create such disruptive situations. But there might be one very important message, that's why I'm telling it already at this point. What we did not allow for the simulation is that we have thunderstorms directly running over the airfield. So blocking entirely the operations in Frankfurt or closing the entire runway. Which of course is a realistic scenario and it occurs. So we are honest at that point. We didn't assume the worst conditions imaginable, but let's say realistic or we are more or less um, probabilistic examples, which were created to perform the use cases. This is clearly one issue where we could talk later on to saying, why didn't you do that? Maybe you would have been interested to say, at what point um, do we reach system load cap and we have disruption. And what also is an, an issue is, of course, the risk um, uh, level uh, philosophy. We are not um, intensifying the research in here. We are doing a lot somewhere else. But, of course, what might be considered, and this is another performance indicator we were introducing, is to say um, when we have a certain time running here and um, we have uh, this disruption situation, um, technically spoken, so the, the synchronization is lost at this point, which might be obvious is that if this is only lasting for a very limited period of time, it might not be critical because we have anticipation in the system, we know where the traffic is with a sufficient precision so that we can say when the synchronization is re-established after a certain delta t, which is not too much on, on a very delta generic formulation, so the risk level doesn't increase significantly. For those cases where the synchronization um, cannot be re-established, within short period of times, but takes longer and longer of cure, something like an exponentially increasing risk level is to be anticipated since um, the, the, that the situational awareness from the system side is getting poorer and poorer. So what we also designed but couldn't use for the benchmark is um, to, to play around with these delta t's and to see what is the um, type of information or the, the length of, of, of disruption time frame which should not be exceeded. This can be done, let's say, on a technical part without simulation. So simply um, to extrapolating where the aircraft would be if it is assuming a wrong vector, a wrong airspeed, and so on and so forth. So you can extrapolate the area, the expectancy area in which the aircraft will obviously be or might obviously be. And if this exceeds thresholds for the resynchronization, then uh, the risk level is assumed to be significantly increased. In very brief, stochastic data modeling has been already mentioned, just to give you data based on real weather data provided by NOAA for Frankfurt, so that's just to have a clear reference on where the data came. The rest is set, I hope. The adverse weather conditions is the next big point. So here we assume again, um, we do not know exactly what, what the wind direction and speed is, in brief, and we let um, the simulation play with uncertain wind predictions. Here we introduced adverse weather conditions and say, we know where the no-go areas resulting from heavy rain cells are. They are dynamic, so they're moving across the ETMA. 
and they invoking the requirement for the aircraft to generate reroutings around these no-go areas while not allowing to uh, let these weather cells travel exactly over the airfield. So let's say we have something like a clearance radius of some 20 nautical miles around the airport in which we didn't allow to let the, uh, let the weather cells penetrate. But the rest is random, but not random academically, but based on the MeteoX data. So we had typical weather patterns based on precipitation data which was used. So we can say the scenarios have some realistic background. And the synchronization again were then to ask ourselves for those cases where the, the quality of synchronization was reduced but not leading to disruption. We invested into the benchmarking, so to say, when we have a lot of reroutings, a lot of reallocations in terms of RTAs to an aircraft, it means that physically an aircraft which should come later than expected, it has to fly past stretching procedure or holding pattern, and this consumes fuel, certainly, and this has been measured, calculated, and then brought into a matrix, and where we can see that poorer synchronization means reduced performance values in terms of benchmark. All this compared to a reference baseline scenario, which will be explained again. This is the data set even in more detail, so we have a clear reference day. If you like, you could re all the data and all the data input used for the simulation, so there is no foggy situation for you as readers of the deliverables. You could look at this data and see, aha, this is what they took. We use different cycles um, in order to see this propagation of prediction quality changes from one cycle to the next. So if you like, you got a, a wind speed and uh, direction 3D cube for the uh, cycle um, midnight. And the, the next forecast time, 6 o'clock in the morning, for the same situation, gave you another one. And so it was interesting to see, having not reached 6 o'clock in the morning effectively, but the prediction for 6 o'clock, how did the data change? So we could, for a 18-hour block, we could see how the prediction quality or how prediction results changed for the same um, airspace um, under consideration. This was also done vertically, um, here expressed by, by, by pressure altitudes and uh, geographically by long lat and north and, and uh, left and upper boundaries. Maybe just to have a small calculation in your head, it's from 0, 3 to 14, so it means we have uh, 70 degrees of longitudes, roughly times 60 nautical miles, reduced by the latitude we have in the system. So you can see 45 nautical miles because it's not a great circle, it's a small circle. So it, it, it comes close to what we presented at the beginning, meaning that the investigation area covered 300 to 500 nautical miles on average. Cool, this is the wind speed analysis. Um, I guess everything is... Um, more or less already mentioned from my side, so I skip to the next slide. One of the results, if you look onto this data analysis and see, okay, um, be aware, um, this is a bit of pity, the altitude goes from here to there, so in a sense, we have here high altitude, here low altitude, and this is what you can see when analyzing the, um, the wind speeds and the wind directions, um, and of course, when you have these different prediction data sets, this is what is really important now, it created a, a distribution, so density function here, yeah? uh, for each, this is for each um, pressure altitude, um, for, a given, for a given area, and so you can see that the variance, or let's say the distribution behavior, changes <coughs> for each barometric altitude, and look from, from above, this would be a box plot representation of the wind speed over the altitude, and it shows that the variance here around the typical flight level, and route flight levels, is quite high, um, so this is um, flight level 300 here, and you see the variance was clearly between um, 22 and 45 knots. This is a 10% quartier yep. and the 90% quartier. The same is true for the direction. What is being considered maybe from your side is to simply say, this is what I expect. Um, wind is increasing um, um, in terms of, of, of magnitude with, with altitude, and it, there is a anomaly which is typically the drop of hours when it comes to the stratosphere. So this is what is typical modeling and it is representing in the three data as well. What we do not see in typical, let's say, textbook style representations is these variances, but we have only the tendency. And now we have the variances and can play with these variances in terms of this is what really the aircraft would suffer when flying through these areas. 
As I said, we encountered one problem, which was to be expected, that we said between these different predictions, you got one and the next one. And the quality of or the, the, the result of this prediction changed sometimes dramatically by whatever reason. This is what the researchers from the NOAA team obviously could explain. So maybe they also talk about anomalies and say, yeah, I don't know, we expected some pressure deviation that didn't occur, some fronts, whatever. So what we had to introduce is what I already mentioned at the beginning, this is what we call low-pass filtering. And to make it brief now, since I already had some talks on that, um, this is what you would get if you use the different um, predictions for the same position in place and time um, based on different prediction horizons. And this is what is being produced when you're using the low-pass filtering. It means it's a smooth situation. So, in brief, the aircraft gets a predicted wind from the over next waypoint once, which is 10 knots from 270, and this algorithm avoids that the next prediction says it is 50 knots from 090, which is not realistic, just to make it very clear. So it, 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 it passes down the amplitudes and came, after all, and this is important from the algorithmic part, it does not, does not uh, let's say, um, compromises the data, in terms of producing another truth, but it guarantees by well having in mind what Dampier was used that the overall collection of the distribution remains the same. This is important, so if you apply this, this filtering process and let the simulation run several hundred times what we did in Utopia, we can assure that for all the simulation, after all, the distribution of wind prediction quality is exactly the same. You can read this in more detail also in the little bit. So it's not, let's say, a nicely tuned uh, reality in order to handle easier the prediction of wind. It is, let's say, what we believe, an anticipation of the reality while granting raw data compliance. This is then um, the, the calibration part. Uh, I guess I can skip that page and leave you with the tendency, what you can see here. And what we see here, the, um, the noise applied uh, wind function again shows a damper process compared to the raw data. And if you would perform the integration over this whole process, you would find exactly the same value as the integration for the real data. And this is for the long flight time. Do not forget, it's like the prediction perspective. And this is then the vertical perspective in terms of altitude, once again, this time correctly presented from top to, to, um, to, to the ceiling, and this is also for the wind speed. So you can see exactly what you saw in the previous picture, but uh, let's say turned around the y-axis since now we have the correct presentation of the altitude. So what finally did we implement? We tried to cover all these uncertainties, which was reference to wind speed and direction for this scenario and we created an extra data set based on standard flight intent and state parameters and deterministic weather data, everything which is included in today's legacy FMS systems. For the wind data, of course, it's sometimes still limited to flight phases. The more modern ones are allowed to have it for each waypoint, but in principle, it's, it's, it's covered. So we extended this by the stochastic expectation values of deterministic weather data for each waypoint. So this is an extended data format, and Michael, when you show the simulation, I guess he can also show you this data format, which is extended and being exchanged between all symptoms. And then what we, from there, uh, created is, yeah, we called it a corridor of uncertainty. It means that we, um, for the cross-track component, we can show, similar to what the RNP concept is also handling with, and saying this is the expectancy volume in, in space where the aircraft will obviously navigate in with reference to these inaccuracies. Um, have in mind that the COU is um, optically or yeah, graphically not able to represent the long track tolerance. This is something which also always should be kept in mind because this is also only a, a, an offset on the, along the flight track. So it shows you the aircraft is a bit earlier or later, but it's not shown graphically in terms of a cube. Okay, so that, that's mainly the issue what we, what we show you with this, let's say, uncertainty modeling component, so it's implemented, and maybe what should be considered that even though we assumed here that the biggest uncertainty source is wind, um, this data concept is open for any type of uncertainty, so the reasons, the causes for uncertainty 
um, are not interesting to the system. They simply say, after all, at this point, this is the quality of data I have to deal with. What then is being um, started in um, is the, the first shot, what we did in Utopia, and saying, this is a typical Gaussian distribution function, you all know this, I'm quite sure. This is the variance of the, of the shape, and so the simple and only shape parameter you need to define the PDF. So this is a stochastic representation of uncertain overflight times at specific waypoints, and once again, the causes for sigma t are not interesting to the system. We know exactly for our scenario it comes from wind speed interaction, but it could be something else like heavy traffic, conflict resolution, and interaction phenomena between different aircraft in a heavy or busy traffic environment. So it must not be related to wind, but for this case this is the assumption. And what we then can do is what the mathematics allow us for those cases when you only stick to normal distributions and not to non-symmetrical distributions like Weibull or Erlang or all these other typically used um, DVDFs, you can simply add these different functions and apply a summation concept for the mean values and for the variances. This is what is very important in terms of simple implementation and quick testing. And so the, um, the variance, which finally is interesting at the initial approach fix, so the point where the Lehman is getting on for the estimated time over is the sum of the squares of the different variances at these waypoints. Of course, um, this is then um, the square and then the, um, the root taken, so it means it's really a module value. The weather conditions have been already tackled, so we're leaving now the wind area and go into the next second bunch. It's about the, the adverse weather conditions, so the weather cell situation I already mentioned that we try to be realistic in this field as well. And so what we did is we took these Meteor X data, um, analyzed the precipitation intensity values for each grid information we got. And when it comes to a certain intensity of humid particles per cube meter of air, and so we considered that this is a heavy rain cell, which is standardized by the VMO, so there is no need to invent new caps and, and, and limits. And so we consider these areas then as heavy rain cells, thunderstorm cells, or no-go areas. So again, a lot of work was done in the background to create the scenarios used for adverse weather situations in the simulation. That's all I should mention here. You can see the resolution and the type of data we got. What also was done, very intensive discussion with colleagues from Hanover. Well, you might remember we had these uh, connections with uh, Theo Hanover and professors from there. And we had a long debate about what is the quality and the stability of these cells in terms of dimension. And we could simply find a very suitable model, obviously, at least it reflects state-of-the-art from the atmospheric research, that we can say we can have a three-fold lifespan of this thunderstorm area, and we have this increasing um, part in terms of radius, so the system um, has a growing character in terms of, of dimensions, then we have a stabilizing part, and then a decreasing or disappearing situation, which is obviously to see. When, when thunderstorms create, they say they blowing up and then um, getting bigger and bigger for a certain period of time. There's a time frame and then it is, remains constant somehow and then it decreases again. So what we also could simulate in, the, in our simulation, which invoked again quite a lot of negotiation requirements between air and ground, is that these cells were not static, they were dynamic in size and of course they moved along um, the wind field across the ETMA. Which is obviously the, the the realistic situation. So that is what we did for the specific modulation or modeling of the adverse weather conditions, and they led finally, when it comes to implementation, to a new type of problem, if you like, for the simulation. So that these cells shown here, again dynamic in size and in place with reference to time, and they um, created in our simulation, a reaction from the pilot crew, not from the arrival manager, from the pilot crew and saying, oops, we have a strong weather reflection, so we have to initiate um, a request for a detour, for a bypass, and that created these areas here, obviously these new um, trajectories, and send down these trajectory requests to the airman with a flag, adverse weather is a reason, so there is a safety issue. So we also investigated in this second bunch of simulations how is the aiming capable of dealing with these rerouted trajectories which have a higher priority because it's something like safety which is being considered and again 
which holds some uncertainty in it, since the, the growing and the dissipation phase is not deterministic and stochastic. Uh, the duration, so the lifetime, is, is, and, and the positioning is also somehow stochastic. It means we do not know exactly where this, where this cell is, we just know on average where it is. So, with regard to, and now I can assume that you easily can follow my reasoning why we said, here we are around Frankfurt, we did not allow to have these compact cells around the Frankfurt airport directly, since if this would be true, what <coughs> would have happened, the actual amen, which was or which is a increased version compared to what is being operational um, and delivered by Baco, would not be able to evaluate very complex trajectories and saying I'm not able with my algorithms to handle this type of, of requests. So we said this is something which should be avoided, but again honestly, this is something which should be investigated further since these are the areas where you have these disruption probabilities at highest level. Directory synchronization, and this is the third and last part, finally looks on different type of synchronization strategies within Utopia. The aim in flight monitoring detects deceleration, calculates a new ground trajectory with a significant delay, so aqua trajectory data are transmitted to the arrival managers. So it means, based on the uncertainty, we have a variations in the arrival time or in the RTA. This initiates new update cycles between ground and air and it leads to adopt the trajectory and in turn it leads to decreased efficiency and fuel burn and increased fuel burn. And uh, the synchronization mechanism finally then can also be calculated by um, so-called time to lose um, formulas in which you simply say what is what should be the scheduled um, value from the aim side and what is the expected uh, time of arrival from the aim side. So if you like, this is a ground-based FMS perspective saying, oh, there's a discrepancy. I have to advise the aircraft to adopt its flight trajectory, so to better stick to SDA. And finally, um, this request goes to, to the airborne side, and those guys say, okay, I really apply this request, and my FMS, as being more specific than this one installed in the aim um, creates another result which might differ at least from, from the expectancy value um, which has been created on ground. And this can mean then that we have the SCA FMS um, could have um, created another time to lose component uh, if we consider from the negative perspective could also be a time to gain. But let's consider this from this perspective. Then we have one part which comes from the ground-based version so it say this is a world the, the AMEN can handle, and this is a second world the, the um, FMS is handling, and the sum of it creates the number of required um, exchanges um, between air and ground. So to say, we have here a discrepancy of 30 seconds, the request and the aircraft calculates, I only need 25 seconds delay according to my schedule. I send back 25 seconds is okay for me, 30 seconds is not feasible. Refer to Amen and Amen says, okay, 25, 25 is approved by the aircraft because it was calculated, so this is a high quality. And um, I try to rebalance my scheduling um, with all the other aircraft around these 25 seconds. So that is, that is mainly the strategy. And, but the hope, of course, is that the 30 seconds are really kept by the uh, FMS, so this rescheduling is not necessary. And the discrepancy between the quality on ground and on the airborne side is an indicator of how much traffic is being introduced. I have a question for you. You say that the uh, distribution of uh, overflight uncertainty is a Gaussian distribution. Do you have any data supporting that claim, or is that just an assumption? As I said, what we did is we investigated into this NOAA data, assuming that the only diversion between true airspeed and ground speed is resulting from the wind situation then the error in measuring the wind and predicting the wind is exactly the distribution of how the aircraft changes is to airspeed versus ground speed ratio. That is the assumption. So I have a distribution of, let's say, I expect 10 knots from north uh, plus minus 5. This is what the data tells me from NOAA. It's and that's already five. Gaussian distributed in NOAA? Yeah, because we have different runs in simulation for predicting the wind at that point. So we had many cycles, we are using the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, still with a given look ahead time, and it changes. And we can do this for many days, if you like. So after all, whatever we do, we get a distribution. Many simulation or prediction says 10 knots, some others say 8 knots, 7 knots, others say 12 knots. So what we can then do is we can fit the normal distribution and see if the quality is a regression coefficient okay or not. Mostly for everything, show that Gaussian distribution is okay for the wind prediction. And then, if you assume not having anything else but wind 
impacting the ground speed of the aircraft, which is only part of the truth, since we well know that there might be a DC advisors which impact also. But if this is true, then of course we can guarantee that for those cases, the ETO behavior over that power point should also follow that distribution. There is no other reason for that. Yeah. And this is what we did in short in the document. Okay. And here we go. The simulation around the bike and your bike. Yeah. Okay, as Hartmut handed over to me, I just want to show you our system environment and how the system are running. Uh, Hartmut mentioned that the Baku provided the Amen environment, and the Amen environment itself it's only has the capability of make some nice sequences for the airport, okay? That's it's their, their job. What the TU Dresden and what the Boeing guys did, that they have some flight management system implemented. We are doing the Airbus part, and they are doing the Boeing part by nature, and uh, what we now need is a, finally a simulation environment. We call it control process. This process is uh, ensuring that uh, all the weather data are, are here and all the traffic data are here and uh, we are initializing the environment here in, in this uh, area. What we are now doing is that Tabot's our simulation environment will create flights uh, considering to a, to a given flight plan and these flights will be controlled into Tabot's and uh, this process ensuring that uh, this flight controlled by this simulator will be scheduled by the arrival manager and they are communicate in terms of a required time of arrival of route structure, something like that. And uh, this way is the same and we can, uh, I will show a uh, small video after to show that our A320 simulation environment can interact with system, that system as well. So each simulator who is able to, to dock in this environment uh, can be managed by the arrival management environment. The idea was to have a center process and each one can connect it to that. On my laptop I have the Barco environment the AIM arrival manager installed in the box. You can see here's Frankfurt environment and I will just show how it, how it works. Uh, and in parallel this system is running. It's a, it's a box running here. It's really a box because it's a it's Linux environment and I started on the Windows environment. The tablets, our simulation environment is looking like that. And um, here's a flight uh, initialized and this flight is uh, I will show you the visualization. Here's the flight available. I have to go to the lateral profile and finally you will see that there's, there's a flight starting over here and go to Frankfurt area. That's a planned flight and there's no, no communication, only one communication, the flight is initialized, it started here and when it started it's sent over to the, uh, the backward arrival management and it's already sequenced because in, in terms of our X10 in terminal area we start sequencing on the earliest part when we are on the radar or even our extended terminal environment. And we can play around a little bit, I don't want to do it that excessive, but um, as Hartmut mentioned, what we are trying to introduce is uh, some additional information. And you see uh, we have wind speeds, normally we work on, on big monitors, so we can put on all information on it. And you can see that the, the wind speed and the wind direction uh, not only covers standard values in terms of uh, uh, fixed values, it covers uh, these uh, sigma values as well. And you can see there's uh, in this model we have chosen from uh, one paper from the scientific community that say, okay, normally you have this uh, degree of sigma. It's not the, in this run, the model Harpo mentioned before where we did our own analysis. It's a little bit more detailed. But we just grabbed this as a main idea, and here you can see we have the same for wind speed and uh, wind direction, these sigma values, and they are inside the system. Uh, what we can do now, I can show you some, some very rough interactions. We will find the, the aircraft here as well, that you can see the aircraft. Uh, I can show you the, the, the route, and uh, I can try to, to reschedule it manually. In terms of what, what normally uh, controllers can do, you can, you can grab the flight and can say, okay, you can grab the flight. You can grab the flight, yeah. And you can say you can be there five minutes later, for example, or a little bit earlier. And if, if you do so, you will see that finally our simulation environment will get this information uh, from the arrival manager and uh, we can act on that. Yeah, and so I just want to show how the system works. I do it now manually, but uh, as Hartmut not mentioned before, and I will do so, we see now one trajectory. And stochastic simulation means that one trajectory is nothing. You have to do 1,000 runs 
in, in these 1,000 run you will see some bunch of trajectories and these will cover your corridor of uncertainty. It is not e really easy to understand because if we see one trajectory, every can imagine how the system works, and, uh, but it gets different if, if 1,000 flights with the same idea run through and through and through. And uh, so I think you get an idea what, what means that, that the, for example, these no-go areas are moving and uh, they are sometimes differ from one run to other run in terms of, uh, of uh, radius, for example. In one scenario, in one run could be a very small cloud, and the next scenario could be a huge cloud. Yeah, and so it, it could be imaginable that this route will look totally different in other runs. So we have to ensure that our sim simulations will all cover that. And finally, when I show you some picture of it, uh, we have six slides, but these six slides took us uh, three months to calculate because we have to do this, this runs every, every time and uh, we have to sh ensure that it's uh, the right idea we go. And when you see there's uh, independent uh, variables, you have so much combination you could check on. So we said, okay, we just choose everything, set it, and one parameter is changes. And we set it the other parameters and try to uh, uh, vary uh, varying this parameter. And so step on, step on. Okay. I do not. I just want to show our capability. The system is running, and the system is even running for 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 now presentation purposes on laptops, but normally on, on big machines. Here you can see a high traffic scenario. So you can see the, the flights are already in the, in the vicinity of uh, the arrival management process. The TAB means it's from Tabard from TO Dresden controlled flight and FCT means it's from FACT, fact from BRTE controlled flights. And uh, yeah. Um, what you can see here, there's, there's no, no conflict resolution at this point. But finally, uh, the, conf uh, the correct separation will be ensured on the initial fixes. And you can see this one gives a short way, the long way, and they are separated finally. So it's one of our problems in the arrival management in terms of thinking what could be improved the next steps. One step could be that the arrival manager gets some additional probabilities to ensure the, the separation all over the, the whole flight lifetime. So what we are going to cover is it. You can see the first uh, holding started over here over here, so the arrival management manager gives some advisors, some RTAs to say, okay, you do not have to be in the system now. I need you in five minutes, but not now. We have to go in holdings. And one big advantage of RTA and the extended and, and uh, terminal environment is that I will ensure that the aircraft has not to go to an holding process, had to be slower on en route, uh, on, on cruise. So that's the idea of it. We have to have to go to, um, to this uh, ETME area. I just want to give you a clue, that's one scenario, and that's, keep in mind, you have to do it 1,000 times for one configuration, and then you have to change a little bit your system, and you have to do it 1,000 times again and again and again. And that's even for stochastic, it's sometimes hard to find the significant, the significant values. You find sometimes some, some measurement, you see, okay, in one run, it could be a good idea to investigate in that, and you see in the following uh, 100 runs, no, no significant value at all. So it's even hard to find the point to go into the system a little bit more in detail. I just want to go into detail. You can read all the other things that I want to say. You know Arrival Manager is from Baco. You know the tablets I mentioned already before is developed by Tio Dresden and the other one, the BRTE FACT environment came from the Boeing guys. And what I mentioned that we are able to bring our 8020 simulation environment as a simulation client in that environment as well. But think about, we are thought about automation. Utopia covers the term automation as well and that's as a single entity controlled by human. It's not that easy to bring these both ideas together, but we just want to show that we are even able to bring in our stochastic approaches in that system, in that FMS system as well. You have the stochastic values there as well, and you can bring it into that system, and you can override and bring some other ideas into it. Here's some ideas what we are bringing in as a scenario data. When we start a scenario, a scenario always looks like this static environment. We have Frankfurt Airport. We have an ETMA of 300 nautical miles. We have some 0.7 run reuse. We have some... Wake water sea variation, that means we use the traffic in the morning, which means uh, heavy transatlantic flights, and we have another time window in the evening with uh, medium flights, so we have other conditions, and we use it to, to find out uh, which is a good idea of traffic and how we can work on that. I don't want to go in that detail, but what you see, this traffic means we thought about traffic situations and we bring it systematically, we increase the traffic amount, we switch the, the mix of traffic and all the other things. 
As the other point, we have to ensure that we can evaluate, that we can have a compare simulation environment so uh, as results. Uh, so we uh, developed some metrics, some external metrics in terms of airline interested in, the airport interested in, and some metrics we are interested in in terms of, for example, sequence stability, in terms of using our algorithms in the operational environment. Thinking about that, I want to just show you some results about this scenario. We have a so-called uh, base scenario simulation. We said, okay, we have a flight plan. We just let fly every aircraft its own trajectory trajectory without uh, intervening. That's just a go, go your way down. We know there are a lot of conflicts, but this could be the best idea. No disturbance. It's not real, but it's far as the baseline. And then the first uh, thing comes as we say, okay, we have to have a sequence on the arrival, on the initial fix. So to have to have this sequence, we have to ensure that we have to have some holdings, some vectory advisors at uh, the easiest way. And we go into detail and said, okay, next step on, we have to the RTA. We have to ensure that they can lose their time on already cruise level. And finally, we investigate unmanned aircraft system traffic just to show what problem could be there at Frankfurt. And there is a problem in Frankfurt because they have medium and heavy traffic, and uh, this one is normally light traffic, and you have some other separation requirements for that. Then we go switch over to the uncertainty handling in terms of weather prediction, in terms of uh, wind. That's the wind part. That's the pre-sequencing. It's uh, hard to mention uh, it before when an aircraft starts inside my ETMA and it's grounded already and I know it's delayed, then it would be a good idea to know how delayed it was and how can I bring it into my system as fast as possible. And the bad weather disruption in terms of no-goes. And uh, finally, the air ground synchronization. It means I ensure that the trajectory is the same for all systems. And uh, the other thing is that uh, I make a correction. Uh, Hartmut mentioned that the system first calculates the time to lose and uh, then it goes to the airborne FMS system and this system recalculates and send another time back to the system and then the aim and adapt this time. It's a small iteration process. The demonstration part we already did.
So I just go directly to the results. When you can see uh, with this vectoring and every one aircraft is initialized on the uh, simulation borders and goes directly to Frankfurt Airport, it looks like this. Every one aircraft do the schedule. So then the arrival manager intervened and said, no, no, you have to ensure that there's a sequence on the final. And yes, you can see, okay, the, uh, he switched a little bit and I can achieve a, a higher usage of the runway. And you can see I can reach the, the limits of the runway, for example. Another one would be a very good thing, uh, the RTA advisories. Here we use a rate of 50% ATA capable flights. We bring it to the system and what we are seeing, very easy saying is, if you use this baseline, everyone can do his own way. You can see you will have a fuel per flight of 7.7 .7 tons. That's the smallest value you can achieve, even if it's not possible. And when you can see that this RTA is uh, activated in the system, the fuel consumption starts with uh, 9.4 and goes down so we can say okay if we including this RTA aircraft can save fuel and the same we can see where it is and other way around we can see that we have to have much more RTA advisors in terms of data traffic yeah remember the the, the curve of uh, increasing system load it will be covered by that so I have to have some messages in the system and you can see they mainly have some holding advisors or not only holding advisors you see uh, some RTA advisor increases the holding advisor in percent. And you can see that the number of uh, capable flights is uh, the same, but that sometimes is a problem. We are good in, 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 in fuel consumption. We are not that good in, in terms of punctuality. The delay increases. Here is an example for UAS. As I mentioned, you have different separation. Introducing UAS in the system means you have higher separation. The capacity drops, and as the capacity drops, normally the delay increases. Here you can see some, some picture over the time. This is a night aircraft uh, reflecting Cessna performance. That's, that's what we did for simplification. Yeah. I think you have now a clue how we go to the system. We have our metrics, we go to the nice diagrams and try to find interesting scenarios and working on that. The very nice part from my point of view is these wind fluctuations. Even if we use the wind prediction, we have some uncertainty in the systems because we do not know how the trajectory really looks like. And if it looks like that, and if you have some special wind components, it could have some influences. And when we have these fluctuations, fluctuations, not that good word, it means our uncertain information. We have the prediction and we have the uncertainty on the top and you can see having these uncertainties means that we have in that scenario only one case running and a lot of cases running you can see there's a bigger uh, deviation. The other way around you can see that the position changes that means the, the workload of the arrival manager in the normal situation with predicted wind the changes only means and in past stretching the arrival manager has to do what position changes in an amount of 50 position changes one position up or down and it has to do a lot of more work if we have our stochastic part into the, the question we could not answer is uh, what, what's where's the boundary where, where's the theoretical boundary where the performance maximum load so in our systems the amen is capable but we do not know if it's in technical environment also capable and would it be capable if the arrival manager has to ensure uh, separation over the old tma for example could be in trouble but we have some or dem demonstrator show the capability that he can work with it. This actual time of takeoff means these inter arrival, uh, these, these times on airports in my TMA. If I know there's already delayed, I can bring it in my system and I cover this as well. We use Stochastic's five years range from Frankfurt Airport, so we can see that it's a different connection between Frankfurt and uh, Dresden, for example, and it's different like Charles de Gaulle or Frankfurt or, or London Heathrow and Frankfurt, and we bring in these values as well, so we can have even a clue about a flight which is not airborne as well. Very important not to mix it up. Um, in the simulation, we have only landings. For yeah. yeah. With zero seven center landings. This the takeoff. The ATOT values are just for these short core flights um, within the DMA. What I mentioned. Yeah, but started on other airports, flying to Frankfurt. Yeah, you can see always oh, it's the same picture. You expect that that uncertainty will have, uh, results in a bigger bandwidth. That's one part we're disappointed because the bad weather is not that bad as we mentioned before. So uh, it's sometimes difficult. But everyone who was in Chicago this year saw that the bad weather really means a bad weather in Chicago, but in Europe it's, it's uh, yeah, the American guys just smiling about when we are talking bad weather, but they had really bad weather. That means our sites are very, very small and they are not that in the close vicinity of the airport and the arrival manager is even capable to handle these small reroutings. 
he has these reroutings, but he can, even in terms of good look ahead time and far away from the airport and only small changes, the aircraft and the arrival manager can compensate these small things. So we have to go into detail, we have to force our system in the next step. So we have thought about that. Uh, one idea is to block inside the TMA. We think about that. Last but not least, this very interesting synchronization problem. If the airmen just use the radar as a surveillance system and they try to think about what could the aircraft do when I see this and they have to anticipate. And this anticipation means that sometimes there could be a problem, a deviation between the own expectations and the things I see on the system. And if it's a good idea, if the aircraft would say, okay, I start to go down now and I reduce my speed and I bring it in my trajectory information, process, sharing process, the uh, A-man could directly use this data and don't have to anticipate by his own, ah, okay, there's this change coming. Or it's not coming, it's already done, and I have to anticipate a little bit later on it. It sounds good, but finally we find out that uh, in the morning uh, scenario there is no big differences in synchronized and not synchronized trajectories. But we find out in the, in the evening, in the afternoon scenario that there could be an effort in have synchronized trajectories. So, okay, we have the first clue, which, which direction we should look in for further investigations, but it's not that big effort we, we, we saw in our simulation runs now. I think the really last part was a correlation. That means that the time to lose concept, this simulation could clearly show that when I have a reaction of my flight airborne FMS and that corrects my ground calculations, I can ensure higher quality. I think it's easy thinking, easy forward thinking. I said you have to lose 30 seconds and the system said, yeah, I bring it in my system, I calculate it with your requirements and I said, okay, 20 will be fine because uh, I have some other boundary conditions in my systems now and the arrival manager can use it, can make a better prediction finally. After a hard part with uh, some textual slides and some nice pictures, yeah, I want to show you some last video. It's more like an idea how we will deal with it, therefore we call it as a showcase. That's our H320 environment and you can see a normal flight management system working. We have some video cameras on it. Uh, the arrival manager is walking. We have from Nuremberg to Frankfurt a route. I think you already saw these pictures before, that's the arrival management and you will see they get now connected as a Utopia client. So. You can see, okay, now it's, it's connected to our system, the flight, it's uh, integrated, it's coming up in the arrival manager. You do all the things you have to do before, you have to send the flight plan, etc. PP. And now after sending it, the flight gets a sequence, get an RTA and they can communicate. So we start now. For the different uh, uh, points, you can see that there's a sigma value in seconds as well.
our system already covers. We already had made an implementation on the simulation environment level, so we can show we have some single entities that are roughly capable to handle with, with the data. There's no standardized process how to deal with it, but we can handle it in a, in a simulation en environment. So I think uh, I can, can stop with this last picture to have in mind what, what we have and to show what we have in mind to do the next step. So it could be a nice idea to go a little bit in, deeper in that and go to these simulation scenarios I presented also a little bit deeper in some, some interesting areas. Thank you. Thank you, guys. We always find it very difficult to fit in uh, a two-year project into a one-hour uh, slot. We, we realize that. The end part, actually, the results is really what I think a lot of people are very interested in. And in fact, there's a report which actually includes the results the, the uh, variation with percentage RTA equipped uh, UAS mixes and so on and so forth is what um, I think Cesar is interested in. So I, I think emphasis on those is going to be quite important, but the, the report will be available. It has a whole bunch of these uh, results and graphs and stuff like that in it. Um, any questions for the last few minutes? Anna. So I'm a controller. I have a question regarding the runway change, which in this scenario would be one of the major disruptions you could have, I, I guess. And how that is linked to your wind prediction, since most runway changes are also about wind direction. Or they depend on the wind direction. So if you could expand on that a bit. Just to correctly understand, you mean we go from 07 to 25? We change the runway in use, yeah. and what would happen with the prediction for the wind? Yeah, or, or, or of the traffic, in fact. You mean that direction, not, not, the, the, not the parallel runway? No, no, no. No, no, the, 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 the no. direction, yeah. yeah. Okay, the, the point is when we are investigated in, in stochastic parameters, it's pretty hard for us to isolate the effect itself. That means when we have some stochastics and some other effects uh, in that scenario working as well, it's hard to say, okay, that was a problem of uncertainty in terms of that was a problem of the run, runway change. Therefore, yeah, the arrival management is, is it's capable to do so, but uh, in our uh, simulation runs, we, we isolated that. We said, okay, there is no change, just to grab on the idea how these stochastic parameters, for example, work. And if we have this in, in detail, then we can even think about what uh, we are, uh, I only mentioned we have the system is set and we're varying only one, one uh, parameter. And when we are starting to vary several parameters, it's hard to, to handle and to identify. So we have now a pretty good clue what, what, what we can change and what the changes will directly result in the, the controller's work, for example. And now yeah, we have to go to practical examples, to practical operations. What does it mean for these? But even in that case, it's hard to find a baseline. What is the baseline? What was the correct part? So yeah, it's, uh, it should be the next work from my point of view. And my second question following to that was, did you, in your, all your runs, did you have wind scenarios that contradict the runway in use? Did you have tailwind? Uh, no, we did not. No, okay. But maybe I can comment on that a bit more from the practical side, since we had exactly this type of study running for Zurich Airport, actually, which is not driven by the uncertainty issues, but, but the question when to change the runway in mm -hmm. use, since tailwind is an issue there. Mm -hmm and a lot of tailwind operations do occur due to political reasons between Germany and Switzerland. And so uh, what Michael was mentioning, when, you, when you're analyzing um, the moment where the supervisor in Zurich is deciding to change the runway in use, uh, typically this should be driven by a maximum tailwind component, for example. But what he explained to me, and this makes really the situation tricky, is that he said, no, no, I have in mind the capacity reduction when I change the runway news. I have in mind the extrapolated traffic load to be expected within the 15 minutes. So I would even accept a high tailwind component versus a runway in use change during high traffic periods. And third, which might be specific for Zurich and for other airports as well, is that I have in mind that this is an unwanted situation from, from the political perspective. Noise issues and so on. So again, what Michael is saying, when we would like to investigate into the effects of stochastics for the runway in use, indeed uh, we should be very clear under which conditions we create the baseline scenario to, to what we benchmark. And uh, I guess we, we should create this type of environmental settings and saying we, we should assume that the traffic load is decreasing this way, 
that the wind speed is increasing that way, for example, and that there is a trade-off which says latest at 10 knots or 8 knots tailwind component we have to change. We have the DCB uh, concept in CESAR, uh, demand and capacity balancing, uh, which I work in. Okay. Where, where we look at that already, so uh -huh. so uh, trying to predict when to change runway and getting the best outcome depending on the KPI we are looking at at that moment. Is that already public? Uh, yeah, we have quite a lot of, of work already done. Good to know. Done mm -hmm. uh, and public is not quite the same thing. But, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. Uh, I have a question on the... Do you have quantification? Uh, on the on the fuel, what are the results per flight? Is it neutral? You can more or less, and how much? Mm -hmm. the, the table you showed. Yeah, uh, the flight performance model we use for that. Uh, they are even capable to calculate the, their, their own fuel burn. And now each scenario, we bring these information together. Not our typical question, but when you're working on aircraft trajectories, the first one is get a higher precision. I have uh, longer routes, I have more fuel burn, so we take all these parameters into. And our hope was that we can have an effort on each of this. So what we can show now is that uh, this RTA capability and the use of RTA could be a good idea in terms of reduced fuel flow. Yeah, that you can see the fuel per flight. The 7.7 .7 is unrealistic, but means if everyone, every aircraft can do this trajectory plan without any disturbance, without any other aircraft, 7.7 .7 should be the fuel. The optimum or? Sorry? Is it the optimum? Not, 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 not the, the optimum, but when, you, when you, the aircraft goes down without any disturbance, without any other aircraft, it's, it's, it's a, a minimum. Yeah, the minimum. It's, it's a minimum. Or yeah. call it theoretical yeah. optimum. Yeah. Because it violates most probably a separation requirements. Yeah. 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 And so, it's what I mean with the baseline, we, we, from, our, from our point of view, we, the first thing, what is the baseline? So we said, okay, we keep the whole system undisturbed, doing nothing. So the baseline is, is what is zero percent in the table here? Yeah, what is the baseline? This has been shown here before. The baseline scenario simply says, I have a flight plan, or a sequence of flight plans, which intends to land into Frankfurt. And for the very first time, I let this aircraft fly down the let's say, the, um, the, the transition and the trombone, and it lands without getting, let's say, controlled. That's the baseline, the fuel flow method. And that's Second, 7.7. 7 .7 7 .7. 7 .7. 7 .7. Yeah. Yeah. And the baseline with 0% says, I allow, I introduce the amen, I allow the yeah, amen uh, to okay. perform oh, gotcha, yeah. um, vectors yeah. and pass vectings, but do not allow RTAs. Yeah. This is zero percent, and then I'm adding yeah. at the third yeah, part yeah, the RTA. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah. It. yeah. yeah. Zero percent means full, uh, full amen uh, capabilities with ATR advices. That means I can have this, this vectoring, I have, can have this holdings, mm. and, and these ATA required type of arrivals as well. And then this, I, I increase the rate of aircraft they can handle my RTA advices, advisories. Mm -hmm. okay. For this amen stuff. You assume that you have, you can use the RTA function for your purpose, hmm. but there are other people who think they're going to use the RTA function for their purposes. Yeah. So it might be for separation purposes, hmm. or it might be for flow control purposes. Have you had any thoughts yet about how you can make your system compatible with other people's? Uh, in, I see this problem that different hmm. people think they're going to have this function yeah. for hmm. themselves. Hmm. How can this how can it be combined? That's a very good one. Actually, on my view, this is a, should be a staggered philosophy. First of all, you got safety first. It means separation maintenance, and that means um, we must be um, we must guarantee the three nautical miles or whatever is valid for the 07 center anytime, and this triggers the MN to set up an RTA. But um, suppose, for example, I mean, this is extended AMN, isn't it? You were hmm. talking about a long yeah. horizon, but it may be that somewhere else, in a non-route sector, mm -hmm. a conflict has been foreseen, and the RTA function is already being used for a safety purpose in a different place. I understand fully your picture of competing strategies using the RTA, mm -hmm. but again, um, my first intent to answer would say we start from the as you said, from the safety perspective, saying the RTA must guarantee safety. And then it should guarantee or improve all of the benchmarks, like capacity, like um, 
e.g. specific procedure facilitation like runway and use changes or fuel burn, again coming back to economies. So um, if we have competing systems, I'm saying I would like to use the RTA function. Those systems using it for safety issues should get preference. Okay, well, well one point is uh, these uh, time-based operations is one point we have to jump on with our stochastics. And then when we go to the arrival management, uh, the arrival manager just even uh, sequence the aircraft by being capable to have to have these RTA. That means when I go to the aircraft and say, okay, you have an RTA of 10 o'clock, for example, and the system said, yeah, I can do it with a sigma value we introduce in our stochastic environment. The uh, arrival manager said the system with the smallest deviation has the highest priority. So we doesn't not even cover only cover the, the RTA itself. We have a second value introduced we can control on. So I think we can, could uh, bring the RTA to other parties and say, okay, you can work on that, but we will need the second value because if you, you deliver me some, uh, some, some comparable RTAs, I have to ensure which one is the best for me to bring in the right schedule. So yes, safety, I think the first thing is, should, should be there, but we uh, extend this and we can show that we can work with this beyond the, the common procedures. But this is more an inter-optimization strategy, on my view, to say within our scope we say those guys who not only saying I can comply with the time, but I can also uh, even comply with it within very small tolerances, got highest priority. Yeah. Yeah. But I guess you were asking rather the question, somebody is totally has totally different intents to use it, RTA. Yeah. And so then this is a César Conops issue, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I guess it is, yes. No. I'm, ju I'm just wondering yeah. how are these different systems going to be fused and, and made coherent? Yeah, but, but this is exactly, you're fully right. Even though you should think about these multiple RTA or uh, time constraint processes where you allocate many, many, uh, or let's say at least two, three, or four of these to the flight plan, which might invoke uh, performance violations for specific flight segments. So uh, you have, let's say, violating strategies. RTA one and two came from, from, let's say, vendor number one, and the third one comes from the third one, and they are not compatible in terms of flight performance. So um, again, um, I guess um, then you have to judge which, which one of these RTAs or required time overs, RTOs, um, should be, let's say, bypassed um, or, or suppressed. And again, it should, on my view, those who are only dealing with capacity or, let's say, performance improvement in, um, issues are not for safety. But no. is my understanding of this as our call-ups, initial 4D is the single RTA, is that correct? Mm -hmm. So that would be what this, this is effectively addressing. Yeah. This is also. Let's say you only have a single RTA point. Yes. Yeah. Um, you might be using it for extended AMAP, but mm -hmm. there may be some conflict resolution tool which is using it for an en route purpose. Or there could be some <coughs> flow management tool which is using it. Yeah. And how do you make sure that the right tool gets to use it? Well, that's what I have. Yeah, but I, I hopefully got it with my yeah. answer, but that's a strategy. Yeah. And for the conflict resolution, I'm not quite sure if an RTA really makes sense, honestly, since if it's far away, uh, what should you say? You, you're decelerating the aircraft in order to keep an RTA, which is being later, and by decelerating the aircraft, you try to um, avoid the conflict, right? That's yes. the idea, in, in brief terms. And uh, honestly, it, it would be somehow easy to... to, to, to to formulate the conflict resolution in a different way and simply saying the ETO or the uh, yeah the, it's, uh, the ETO required for, for avoiding the conflict um, should be adopted and the RTA let's say so this what we anticipate to the EIF or the final approach fix should not be um, that's attached once we are in Android. It, it, there is no necessity. We could decelerate and increase speed again later on, which might be not useful in terms of economical issues, but it would both, let's say, resolve the conflict and stick to an RTA requirement coming from an AMAN or for a flow control unit, as you say. Okay. Quick, one, one okay. quick one. Yeah. Yeah. The question is, um, the synchronization mechanism between the air and the ground systems, was it for only for the RTA flights or for all of them. The question, uh, the question is, in some cases you could have flights that could send you some data, but actually the prediction in the air might be of a lower quality than the one you could have on the ground because you've got better weather 
information, for example, mm -hmm. on the ground rather than in the air, or at least well, when, when you've got an accident debate on the horizon, you could have this kind of discrepancy. So how do you know uh, which one of the two performs better? Trust? Yeah. Performs better. Which yeah. one of the two performs better? We, we just have this discussion, I think, since mm -hmm. two and a half years, because we are, we are thinking uh, who, who should decide. Yeah. This guy should decide who has the best information, who has the best information. So it's, it's pretty hard to understand. From my point of view, the, the aircraft could be a sensor. And if you have so many sensors around you, they can predict you the best, they can send you the best data, even in terms of the aircraft in front of you knows exactly. And if you have a, mm -hmm. just an idea, and if, if you are able to communicate with these both systems, each of one aircraft can calculate its own ideas. The problem is when you have too many guys with too many ideas in uh, one area with uh, you get uh, get squeezed into, yeah, you get in trouble. Therefore, these decentralized centralized decision making is another problem, even in terms of if you have uncertain systems. Yeah, you can so this one has some intent, this one has this intent. They have some some dithering around, and they are going to one system. It could be a good idea to say, okay, only one information at one point, and this one decided. This could be they have a higher system load on one point. So there are so many ideas, and what, what we decide now is we have an information process. That means the aircraft can directly interact with the AMEN, and over the AMEN with, with another aircraft, because the AMEN do the schedule, and I have a system answer in terms of, it's my intent that the system answers me, so it's not a direct communication. It's the easiest way because of, in terms of speaking of complexity. And so this, our communication process always means we have, we're sending the trajectory data, in terms of uh, AIDL or something like that, uh, XML data set with all our information into and we are assuming that the aircraft has the best information in terms of I am there and I have the information. Mm. But one thing is still open, that these data will not start in the AMEN for the other aircraft in terms of the aircraft has to, has to have to have a clue which data is here and make its own calculations. But in this term, the arrival manager knows better because they already know this transformation idea in terms of I know better, I have more quality. We thought about that, but we, we excluded from our ideas now. But I think this one could be one interesting part for the next month. It all relies on, on your concept of orations you, you're assuming. And uh, this is WP1, and what we did is, in brief, is we're assuming that the aircraft knows perfect, perfectly, at least at best level, um, about its own intent information which includes the assumption that weather data, for example, is very precisely known in the aircraft. If this is not true, you're fully right. Yeah, yeah. Just and uh, then, then we had to switch prioritization between the different, let's say, up and down link requests. In yeah. fact, this is a question we are, we, we are discussing on uh, air ground trajectory synchronization. Yeah. This, the question is, from industry also, is yes, but how can you do that? Because we, we won't just copy-paste the trajectory from the aircraft. Yeah. Must be able to, mm. well, for many different reasons, yeah. uh, yeah. must be able to make some assessment. And it can get quite complicated. Absolutely. And, well, yes. Maybe one, one hint just for the adverse weather condition, as I mentioned, there we made it the other way around sometime in, that, in such a way that we um, allow the aircraft to say, I got a problem. It's, he is the detector of problems, if you like, the sensor, and saying, I have a adverse weather array, I have to bypass. So he is initiating a request to the AMEN saying, please allow me to bypass. And he say, okay. Um, for all other cases, it's the AMEN who says, please adopt the RTA in such a way that uh, my sequencing is optimum. So there the requests go from down to up, and the airborne, says, airborne system says, I'm able to do so or not. So we have these, these strategies covered some extent by these three big areas, but you're fully right. The question is, is this always true? And uh, what is the prerequisite to provide all this data to the aircraft in terms of uh, the variances for the wind prediction, which is specifically uh, the yeah. case for here? Yeah. Okay. But on that point, we have to, to ensure that it's, it's only wind is, weather is one part, but what, what the aircraft is knowing the best is its own speed and own direction. So it, he will be the, the, the master of that. And uh, now we have to ensure it's weather data more to bring to the master, or do I do a second center that only cover the, the, the atmospheric conditions? So, it's, it's hard, but I think it's a nice nice playground, even in terms of complexity, even in terms of a uh, huge uh, scenario. We are working on uh, one of the mainstream work that are, which is trajectory management. Mm -hmm. So we have this issue with the trajectory synchronization. I think it's very good to see the work package yeah. during the same thing.
doctor, you know, we can, uh, so we, we are waiting for the report. Yeah. yeah. Same thing, we try to provide some synchronization algorithm, but it just, yeah. it don't, they don't exist really in the real mm. system today, so we can't yeah. mimic them in a model, it's just, yeah. well, we think that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, I think if we, we could have some, some bilateral communications because uh, as a uh, report is, you bring in your results and uh, not, not the fails. Yeah, you're thinking of so, so many things, I said, okay, yeah, I thought about that, but it wouldn't work like this. Uh, we are not writing all these things down, but we have all the, the things in mind and we know what we are thinking is a good idea or not a good idea. Uh, it would be a good idea from our side uh, just to, to bring it to, to one page to show that our statement about that could be good good for you as well, just to see, okay, they are thinking in that way. You don't have to agree on that, but to say, okay, they are working on this, they're dealing with it, they have some problem with it or not, and they are thinking it's a good way or not. And we will have uh, two PhD works completed by the next two, six months, roughly, one about flight efficiency, one about high precision flight trajectory prediction, which, let's say, in itself um, analyzes very detailedly the effects of, um, again, of uncertain, not wind conditions only, but also about uncertain engine conditions. So the efficiency the aircraft actually um, can bring up a show up in order to comply with the RTA function. So that goes into, a, let's say, competing analysis with BADA 4. Yeah, so although this area is quite intensively tackled now at Dresden, and we will have completed this by the beginning of next year. It will be interesting for work package 10 as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Because we have the operation work packages, yeah. we have a corresponding okay. mm -hmm. technical work package. Yeah. So the guys which are dealing with the trajectory prediction and implementation prototyping. Okay. So they are working now on yeah. how mm -hmm. to synchronize, how to <coughs> they've, been, they've been in contact actually with uh, Jean Bouquet and uh, Ibrahim yes. and, yeah. and those guys. Mm -hmm. So some of the earlier deliverables. Yeah. The yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, thank you guys again for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs>